Thank you. Thank you for coming along to hear about translating research into policy issues and challenges for researchers. So we have a huge variety of terms that are used in this uh, research translation space. Knowledge transfer, knowledge translation or KT, and that'll be the acronym that I'll use today. Dissemination, research influence, bench top to bedside. <laughs> knowledge utilisation, technology transfer, bridging the no-do gap. Advocacy, we'll come and talk about that. And of course, all this is about research impact. Translating research into policy is about generating research impact. And impact, I don't need to tell anyone here, is now essential. Our own 2025 UNSW strategy says that in our social engagement and global impact, we need to translate our discoveries into social benefit. The Australian Research Council has an engagement and impact assessment. They define research impact as the contribution that research makes to the economy, society, environment or culture beyond the contribution to academic research. They also have a research impact pathway for people to have a look at. And of course, the NHMRC has on its website reasonably prominently, the creation of knowledge does not of itself lead to widespread implementation and positive impacts on health. The knowledge must be translated into changes in practice and policy for the benefits to flow to Australians. So that's why you're all here. That's why I'm talking about this topic. Research translation is about impact. It's two different types of translation. Translation into practice. So for example, a GP doing something different or an engineer building a bridge in a different way or translation into policy, which in this instance is about government decision making, about legislation um, and about strategic direction. And my work is in relation to policy, not in relation to practice. So this presentation is about translating research into policy and the issues are different, I think, when we're talking about translation into practice. I'm going to cover four things. Um, firstly, I'm going to talk about research translation strategies. That's pretty obvious, I think. I'm going to then give you a case example. Then I'm going to tell you why it doesn't work. <laughs> and then I'm going to draw some conclusions. So the, there's an enormous documentation of the barriers in relation to bridging the research policy divide or closing the no-do gap. Um, there are barriers on our side, the research side. Research often is actually quite marginal to policy decision making or it has an uncertain relationship with what it is that policy makers are interested in. It is also often contradictory and equivocal. That's actually the nature of the scientific method. Um, so that's a barrier perceived by the policy side of things. It's actually missing in heaps of domains. Um, in the area that I work in, in relation to illicit drugs, there's a lot of research evidence we just don't have to inform um, policy decision making in Australia. It takes a long time, as we all know. The research environment doesn't necessarily reward policy relevance, or I think that might be changing. And there is a particular skill set, which I'll talk about in a minute, for translating research that has nothing to do with being a good researcher. On the policy side of things, there are a whole bunch of barriers. Firstly, it's a really time-tight environment um, where rapid decisions need to be made. Change is occurring constantly, even though it feels enormously sluggish in the drugs policy area. Um, there is rapid staff turnover for people like myself and others here who work with government. We're constantly being introduced to a new set of bureaucrats and redeveloping relationships and building trust. Another factor is that policymakers don't actually access research. And this is not because they don't want to, but that they can't. What we forget about as academics is that our computers are automatically connected to the university library and so on. If you go and log into a niece or a nephew's computer, you'll find paywalls constantly um, where you can't, you might get the abstract and obviously some things are open access, but actually it's quite hard to access research and I think we forget because we do it every day, we forget that other people can't. 
And lastly, of course, there are other influences on policy that are much more important than research evidence, and I will be talking about that. Oliver and colleagues did a systematic review in 2014 um, and identified the two key factors, the two key barriers. The first was the access to the research by policymakers, and that's on the policymaker side, on our side, the relevance, reliability and clarity of our research findings. So I'm going to talk about five classes of strategies. Um, doing the research, disseminating the research, knowledge brokers, dialogue methods and expert influence. The first of these, how the research gets done, is really fundamental. So translation begins before the study even starts. It begins before you ask what the research question is. And it actually begins with choosing the right research question. If you want your, your research to be policy relevant, you've got to choose a research question that is relevant to the decision makers of the day. Now clearly there are constraints around that, but in terms of impact, this is definitely about choosing the right question. Secondly, getting translation and impact is about engaging multiple stakeholders. Conducting a piece of research in the ivory tower is just not gonna get it there at all. And engaging multiple stakeholders, including obviously policy decision makers, but community members, and people in my world of drugs with lived experience, so consumers, is fundamentally important to the way in which the research gets conducted and the likelihood that it will be translated. And the third thing that I think sometimes gets forgotten is that the research has got to be good. Um, we can all do quick and dirties, um, but that doesn't cut it. You've got to maintain the quality of the research if you're looking for impact and translation. So that's how we do the research. So it starts right back at the very beginning before we've even designed or selected a research question. The second class of strategies is how research gets disseminated. So this is not disseminated in conferences or in journal articles. This is disseminated to policy makers. The sorts of dissemination strategies for effective translation include a bulletin, a one-page bulletin, or a summary of the results. It includes briefings to ministers and to advisers and to bureaucrats. People forget that they are three different areas of policy making in Australia, and certainly it's relatively easy to get a briefing to a bureaucrat. It's a bit harder to an advisor, and it's even harder to a minister, depending on your connections, but all three of them require briefings. There's the whole area of media, media announcements, social media, actionable messages, um, and of course the killer graph. The reason why these things are important, and this is some work I did a few years ago, I um, interviewed policymakers around Australia in relation to illicit drugs, and I asked them to recall their last policy decision. Once they had that firmly in their mind, I asked them, so where did you access research? in making that decision. All of them find a friend. If you're not on speed dial, if they don't have your number, they're not going to gain access to your research findings. All of them consulted a bulletin or a technical report that happened to be sitting around in the office. And the level of kind of accidental sitting around in the office is quite scary, but that's what happens. So monograph series, technical reports that sit in a bureaucrat's office make a difference. Just over half of them accessed the internet. This was not PubMed. Um, this was not Google Scholar. This was Google. And you can, as I said, if you get on someone else's computer, find out whether your study, if you type into Google, not on a UNSW computer or one you've used before because of the algorithms, you'll find very quickly whether a policymaker will find your research or not. More, just more than half of them you also use statistical data and that's probably a feature of illicit drugs. We're constantly surveying the population either through the wastewater or through um, surveys. So bureaucrats in my field use data a lot. Half of them rang a friend in another state and said, what did you do about pill testing? Um, and only a third used the academic literature. So clearly publishing in the academic literature, whilst very important, bears no relationship to um, research translation into policy. So disseminate, disseminate, disseminate and disseminate effectively using all the strategies that were on the previous slide. 
The thing about dissemination is it's relatively passive. Knowledge brokers is an idea that this needs to be about a relationship. So uh, Jonathan Lomas from Canada has done a lot of work in this area. He describes knowledge brokers as the intermediaries between researchers and the end users. And knowledge brokerage as all the activity that links decision makers with researchers facilitating their interaction. It's a reasonable amount of literature about knowledge brokers. I should say I'm going to give you the evidence base for these five strategies a bit later on. Um, I'm smiling because there isn't any. Um, <laughs> There are three types of knowledge broker roles. The first type is knowledge management. So this is where you take a piece of research, create a tailored product, create comms, and engage in information sharing. The second type of knowledge brokerage role is what's called linkage and exchange, which is about networks and connections with stakeholders. And the third type uh, or activity or role is capacity building, so facilitating organisational change and promoting reflective practice. Knowledge brokers, what are their attributes? They're very entrepreneurial. They're people who can network, who can problem solve, who can innovate. They are trusted and credible. They are very clear communicators and they are culturally astute. And by that I mean they understand the culture of research in universities and how to talk to academics, and they understand the culture of policy and politics and the environment, um, the, the cultural environment of policy decision making. Knowledge brokers can be individuals, and I regard myself as an example of someone who's a knowledge broker in my particular domain, or it can be organisations. So the Sachs Institute, I'm not sure whether everyone's familiar with the Sachs Institute, but that's an organisation that I think is a knowledge brokerage organisation that works at the linkage between um, research and, and policy. There's this emerging idea of a technology transfer office in American universities, the TTOs, that have taken over from the older media and comms type office. And the idea is that media and comms was more about passive dissemination, and now we need to actually broker um, that, that knowledge in more relational or interactive ways. And these technology transfer offices have as their responsibility knowledge brokerage. I was chatting briefly about the UNSW Knowledge Exchange um, um, unit, um, which I can't quite yet cast into this array of knowledge translation strategies, but I think it's actually an income generation um, strategy rather than knowledge exchange. That's my personal opinion. It does not reflect the University of New South Wales. <laughs> Issues associated with knowledge brokerage. So the problem is once you become a knowledge broker, so if you're someone who a, a policymaker will ring, they will ring you about your particular domain area, decriminalisation of drugs or pill testing in my case, and then they'll ring me about um, prevention programs in schools. And the problem is that once you become a trusted and credible source, you need to actually be really clear about what you don't know and how to then link them with someone else who might know the answer, rather than becoming someone who answers all of their questions and potentially is not strongly grounded in the evidence that you know yourself. There are many models of knowledge brokerage. There hasn't been good evaluation of the different models. Great PhD topic. In fact, this whole presentation is full of PhD topics. <laughs> um, we need to evaluate different ways of doing knowledge brokerage. You all know that the academic incentives for this kind of work is low, and it's not necessarily explicitly funded as part of our roles. The fourth class of strategy is dialogue methods. So, so the knowledge brokerage is kind of a role for an individual, whereas dialogue met methods are opportunities for a group of policymakers and researchers to come together to deliberate, to discuss um, problems, and in particular to reflect on questions, you know, how would you move this piece of research evidence into policy? They're highly interactive, they also engage multiple perspectives, Often they're run according to Chatham House rules, which means that you can talk about what happened but not ascribe any of the comments to any one individual. Policymakers see these as very safe opportunities um, 
and particularly if you've got a neutral facilitator. Um, as part of my program early on when we started in 2006, we ran a series of roundtables with policymakers um, on particular topics that were vexing them. And it's a, it really is worthwhile trying to think about whether you can set something like this up um, from the academic side of things. Um, but of course, policymakers organise roundtables themselves. And in a survey, Australian New Zealand School of Government survey, survey policymakers about their best translation mechanism and they nominated um, dialogue methods over knowledge brokerage. So they would prefer this process than someone coming and explaining and translating the research evidence to them. And of course Australia has a particular penchant for summits. It's unusually Australian. 2020 summit, effective knowledge translation, hmm, not sure. Um, but we have had some really good examples of effective summits, including the New South Wales Drug Summit in 1999, which saw, as a result, the introduction of the Medically Supervised Injecting Centre. Now, that would not have happened if there had not been this dialogue amongst politicians, bureaucrats, experts, but also community members and people with lived experience. So it's bringing all of those stakeholders in together to deliberate, argue and discuss. So the last strategy is a kind of a grab all, um, and I've called it expert influence. It's a bit like the knowledge brokerage role. It's got some of the components of the dialogue method. It's certainly about dissemination, but it is about how we position ourselves as individual academics for the long haul. Um, being in the business of translating your research for change, in my case, to improve government decision making around drugs is not something that I'm going to do for six months or 12 months. It's something I'm going to be doing for my career, I guess. And so this is about cultivating relationships with decision makers and doing all of those things that we don't get credit for in our day jobs. Being on committees, boring committees that meet for half a day once a month, writing submissions to government, presenting evidence at parliamentary inquiries, picking up the phone, responding to the email, chasing down an article that someone's written that's behind a paywall. You don't even know the article, but you're trying to find it for them. PDFing it, saving it, sending it off. Just so that when they do want to talk to me about pill testing, they will phone and go, what do you think? What do we need to do with this particular situation? And all of these things, being able to spend time on all of these things, I think is really important, but it's hard. And it's often accidental. So I don't know how many committees I've been on where after eight months I've thought, why on earth am I going to this committee? And then someone says, we need to do something about, I don't know, whatever, needle syringe programs or peer distribution of injecting equipment. And I get the chance in that five minutes to say to those committee members, actually, yes, you do, and let me tell you about the evidence base around that and what we know and what we need to do now. And it gets recorded in a set of minutes from a bureaucratic process, and then you're on. And you cannot predict it. You can't predict which meeting or which committee will give you that opportunity. So it's very difficult, and it's even more difficult because we don't know whether any of these five strategies work. Con the way we conduct the research, the way we disseminate, knowledge brokerage, dialogue methods or expert influence. I can't tell you what your best investment is. We are lacking a knowledge base around knowledge translation. There have been a couple of systematic reviews published, and I think they're kind of instructive. So the first one was by Moore and colleagues. It was Public Health, 2011, translating public health research into public health policy. They located 106 papers written on translating research into policy. 59 of them were descriptive. 42 of them were conceptual. Five were actually intervention studies on how to do translation. And a much more recent systematic review by Sarkis, published in 2017, the references are on the slide, found 19 studies that were actually intervention studies. Sadly, both of these systematic reviews concluded that there is a paucity of evidence. They were largely non-significant findings, or they found that knowledge changed, as in policymakers became more knowledgeable, 
but they did not actually change action or produce policy reform. That could be fairly depressing. Let me pick it up now and tell you about a case study, um, which is another form of evidence in the policy translation space. So, um, for those people that don't know, um, in relation to illicit drugs in Australia, when you're caught by police, they need to decide whether they need whether to charge you as someone who's a user of drugs, so charge you with a use possess offence, or charge you with a supply offence. If you get charged with a supply offence, you're going to get a much more significant sentence, including in New South Wales, a life sentence, depending on the quantity. If you're charged with use possess, you'll obviously potentially receive a caution and or a much lighter sentence. So how do police decide whether to charge someone with use, possess or supply? Well, in other countries, they decide based on evidence, like scales to weigh the drugs or a wad of cash or packets that the drugs have been cut up into. However, in Australia, there is no evidence that means that you're charged with a supply offence. It's based on the number of grams. So they weigh the drugs. If it's over, in the case of heroin, two grams, you're charged as a supplier. And if it's under two grams, you're charged with a use possess offence. So these are hugely significant laws. And they're called threshold quantities. Australia's not the only country that has them. There are some other countries that have them. But no one's queried what the appropriate threshold quantity should be. In October of 2010, we were approached by the ACT Department of Justice and Community Safety, and they said to us, we want to evaluate the current ACT drug trafficking thresholds, and we want to decide what the threshold should be for supply, traffickable commercial and large commercial offences. And this work was done with my colleague, Dr. Caitlin Hughes, um, and we jumped at it because we know how important these set of laws are to people's lives. We were commissioned to undertake the research. We did a very careful and thorough analysis. We developed five different metrics for deciding what the threshold quantity should be. We expended considerably more resources than the amount of funding that we were given by the ACT JACS, uh, Department of Justice and Community Safety. And we produced a report, which is an NTRO, non-traditional research output. <laughs> we didn't publish it in academic, um, an academic outlet. And we made policy recommendations. We basically said you need to increase the threshold limits for cocaine and MDMA, and you need to decrease the threshold limits for heroin and methamphetamine. And that's the monograph in our monograph series. What did we do about dissemination? We did extensive dissemination. So we held a teleconference with the Drug Schedules Working Group. We had reps from health, policing, DPP and legal aid. We then held a round table based on the results with additional ACT and national experts. We then held a dedicated consultation with people who use drugs and talked to them about um, the work that we'd done, the metrics and the threshold quantities that we'd come up with and we gave private briefings to the ACT Attorney General and to the Chief of Police. ACT amended the Criminal Code. Yes. <laughs> um, completely in line with our recommendations and the Attorney General of the time, Simon Corbell, when he introduced the Criminal Code legislation amendment, said the government has been provided with expert advice from the Drug Policy Modelling Program at the University of New South Wales. And the amendments were exactly in line with what our report had recommended. Why did this work? So I think it's fairly obvious that throughout the whole um, experience of this particular study, we used all of those five different strategies at various points. The first thing is the research question. It wasn't our question. We, we were committed to this topic and we knew it was an important policy area but it was actually the ACT, Department of Justice and Community Safety, that asked the question, and it was their question. And we actually might have asked some slightly different questions. Um, we've gone on and done more work on threshold quantities and deemed supply, which is 
part of the legislative base as well. But it was commissioned research. Commissioned research makes a difference. Commissioned research is so important. It's because the question being asked is the one that's relevant and they want to know the answer to. Um, we can't live without investigator driven research, but commissioned research is where the translation game really is at, in my opinion. Of course, no research is conducted without a broader context. There was national attention to the issue of threshold design. It was a topic of conversation around Australia. There was also a fairly um, common sense problem with the legislation. So in the ACT at that time, three MDMA pills were regarded as a supply offence. Now you don't need to have gone to a festival or to have taken MDMA to know that three tablets is not consistent with someone who is supplying MDMA or ecstasy. So there was kind of a, a face validity problem to the legislation that really assisted with the Attorney General being able to change it. We love working in the ACT. They're a fantastic jurisdiction. They're small, the bureaucrats are really skilled, they're highly committed um, to evidence. Um, and because we had relationships with both justice and health, that made a really big difference. We involved a range of stakeholders, which I've talked about throughout. And I think lastly, and importantly, I would emphasise that we understood what our role was. And this is a quote from the report. By necessity, designing an alternate set of drug trafficking threshold quantities requires consideration of multiple factors, the evidence base, value decisions, technical and legislative feasibility, etc. This report considers only the evidence base. So we positioned ourselves very carefully in, in our approach to this work, in the way we talked about what our role was. It wasn't to write the legislation, it was to provide an evidence base for others to then consider and write the legislation. Bringing us all back down again, for every one of those, we've got five that didn't work. So I think you saw that was monograph number 22. I think we're up to monograph number 27 in our monograph series. So actually, this is an extraordinary one-off. I think we got really lucky and all of the stars aligned. Um, and we were effective at what it is that we were doing. I don't want to take away, certainly not from the enormous work that Caitlin did on that. But I think we need to talk about why it doesn't work, because that is the much more common experience. And I'm going to talk now about four different aspects of why research doesn't translate into policy impact. The first of these, and it is so bloody obvious, is not all research is instrumental. And I think somehow the university and ARC and NH and MRC and everyone just completely forget that sometimes research is not about solving an immediate problem or a sort of instrumental solution. And I think Carol Weiss has written very well on this topic in her work on research utilisation. And she identified a number of different ways in which research evidence is used, instrumental or direct. That's exactly what that case example was about. Sometimes research is about problem solving. Sometimes research is about new knowledge. And we need to recognise that that is not necessarily able to be translated. Not all research is translatable. And I don't know how we sell that message up and across, but we need to. Sometimes research is political. Um, they already know the answer and they want to support a position or build ammunition. Sometimes research is tactical. If only Gladys Berejiklian had rung me and said, would you like to study pill testing? She could have stood up and said, I'm engaging researchers to study this problem. I'm being responsible. I'm delaying having to make any decision. Whether I would have undertaken tactical research, don't know. And of course, the last one which Carol Weiss talks about is enlightenment. This is about the generation of new ideas which permeate over time in the policy environment and become part of the backdrop, waiting for the appropriate time when they will be taken up. So not all research is instrumental. Not all research can be translated. Don't give yourself a hard time if, you're not, if you don't happen to be doing instrumental research. The second issue is policy. The process of policy decision making. So one of the problems with the knowledge translation um, paradigm, if you like, is that it assumes that 
We generate the evidence, we then translate it into useful information for policymakers, and they then implement it. Some kind of technical, rational model of policymaking. Of course, it is nothing like that. It is all about power and actors and politics and right time and opportunity. And I think if we're going to be in the business of translating research into policy, we need to understand policy and we need to move beyond a naive kind of technical rational model of policy making. There are a number of policy theories. I um, could do a whole other seminar on policy process theories, but just to highlight a couple, um, Kingdon's multiple streams. This is an approach about policy change that says there are three streams of activity that are going on in parallel all of the time. One is the problem stream. Some of us researchers hang out in there and collect data about the extent of the problem. The other stream is the policy stream where solutions are being generated. Some of us hang out there. And then there's the politics stream which is the decision making and the, the politics of it. And of course we're not the only people in these streams. There are community organisations, there are advocacy groups and so on, there are um, bureaucrats. Policy change happens when there's a window of opportunity which opens and someone, what Kingdon calls a policy entrepreneur, matches the problem stream with the policy stream with the politics stream. And those three things get matched by a policy entrepreneur who is not a knowledge broker but a policy entrepreneur, and I'll talk about this a bit more in a minute. So as soon as you appreciate, if that's a kind of useful heuristic for understanding policy, if you're thinking about how do you translate your piece of research into policy, one, you better know the windows, you better know the policy entrepreneur, you better work out whether you're in the problem stream or the policy stream, and so on. It's not, you know, sending a bulletin with the highlighted policy initiatives. Um, Carol Weiss has um, the three I's, ideology, interests and information. And that's another way of thinking about the complexity of the competition between those three things to generate policy. The other thing that I think is pretty obvious is that most of the knowledge translation literature is focused on individuals. It's about me communicating my research findings to an individual bureaucrat or advisor or minister. Policy is not about individuals, policy is about systems, about institutions and actors and, and policy subsystems. And as Paul Kearney has said, to have translational impact requires a profound level of engagement with the system, not just with one part. And I've mentioned Kingdon's policy entrepreneur, the person that links those things. Um, Sabatier in his advocacy coalition model of policy making talks about the policy broker who works between the different coalitions. These are relational, ongoing, um, specific roles in getting change happening. Policy is also ambiguous and with unclear preferences and anyone who's following both the New South Wales election and the federal election can see this played out loud and clear in the media on a whole bunch of issues. And more research evidence does not help adjudicate between unclear preferences. In the policy world you cannot separate facts from values, that might make us feel quite uncomfortable. But the reality is if I'm in the business of tackling, for example, decriminalisation of drug use, I need to work with the values and the core beliefs of the policy makers for effective policy reform. So this then leads us into advocacy. Is knowledge translation advocacy or is advocacy something else? I'm talking about the academic as advocate, okay, because there's lots of other forms of advocacy, but for today we're just focusing on the academic as advocate. So here's a couple of definitions of advocacy. Michael Moore, public health, persuading decision makers of the need for change through identifying desired public health outcomes and effective and feasible methods of achieving that change. WHO back in 1995 combination of individual and social actions designed to gain political commitment, policy support, social acceptance and system support for a particular health goal or policy. I would have said both of those statements are entirely consistent with knowledge translation, with UNSW 2025, 
And I think we're engaged in the business of advocacy. However, many of you might know Simon Chapman on uh, public health and in particular tobacco, written a lot on advocacy. He sees it as a fraught, politicised activity. Um, Haynes and colleagues in a review said that some people thought advocacy was fundamental to being a public health researcher. Other people thought it was completely disparaged and one shouldn't engage in it. And most recently, Catherine Smith and Stuart have written a lovely um, paper published in SoxiMed um, drawing the distinction between advocacy as completely a disciplinary duty and a responsibility of advocates on the one of researchers on the other on the one hand and as a version of political propaganda on the other so the question is is advocacy knowledge translation can i just say i did the research integrity training last year and i failed the questions on advocacy so if you haven't done the research integrity training yet um, yeah beware one of the things that's helped me, I think, clarify what I think advocacy is and the fact that I am an advocate, an academic advocate, is differentiating advice, advocacy, lobbying and activism. This is a great thing from ODI, Overseas Development. So basically, this grid divides on two dimensions. Along the horizontal axis is if you're in, on the inside track, so you're cooperating within government in this instance or policy, or you're on the outside track. And then the um, vertical axis is whether you're advocating from an evidence or science base or whether you're advocating on an interest or value base. And they basically map advocacy as being evidence or science based on the outside track and advising as being evidence based on the inside track. Lobbying, inside track, interest and values based. And activism, Greenpeace, outside, it's actually a bit old, 2004, outside track and interest space. This has really helped me. I think there is a role for academic advocacy and I think it sits above the line. I think people's private lives, they can engage in activism and lobbying, whatever. Um, but I think as, as long as we're committed to the evidence and science-based side of things, I think advocacy is not a dirty word and is very important. So if we talk about ethical, responsible, academic advocacy, there are a set of skills that aren't the same as conducting research. Pretty much everyone who's written on this topic talks about respecting the evidence. I think that's crucial. I think it's sometimes hard to do when you're forced into a sound bite or a kilograph that moves a couple of elements to smooth the line. <gasps> no one would ever do that. That wouldn't respect the evidence. But then there's a whole lot of communication skills like metaphors, framing, memorable statements. Simon Chapman's famous, the introduction of smoke-free areas in restaurants, the non-urinating section of the swimming pool. <laughs> He's fantastic. You just, I just think, if I now could think up something as smart as that. The use of social media, killer facts and sound bites. Why do we worry about advocacy? Why are we kind of like anxious about it? Why does the research integrity thing say it's kind of a bad thing? Well, I think it's stepping beyond the data and I think that's a real thing we need to be very careful about and think through. It's obviously not necessarily recorded, uh, rewarded in the academy. I think there are credibility issues. I think people can, academics can damage their credibility by being too strong as an advocate and I think they can damage their policy credibility as well. Um, I think we're not necessarily equipped. Oh, Reading in preparation for today, I read this thing that research shouldn't make policy recommendations because that would be advocacy. And I, just, oh, I think, oh, this is just completely fraught. And the last point, importantly, is is this issue about advocacy actually elitist and undemocratic? And I will come back to that very quickly. Other thoughts on advocacy, it's really complicated and I'm not suggesting there are easy solutions. All of research is shaped by values and ideologies and to pretend otherwise, in my opinion, is not helpful. So I don't think there's this idea of advocating for objective facts. Are you best placed to be the advocate? Maybe there are advocacy organisations that you can give your results to and that's what we do. We brief an advocacy organisation, we give them the data 
our media releases, and then they can go out and tell the story in a very different way from the way in which we might tell it. There are conflicts of interest, there are personal risks, and there are many terrible stories about academic advocates, and it's a per personal choice. And Simon Chapman says, grow a rhinoceros hide if you want to get in the business of academic advocacy. And the last issue is the role of evidence. I've talked about policy as complex, dynamic, political, as systems of beliefs. I've talked about research being only one input. I think what we sometimes fail to recognise is the privilege of the research stance that we actually have. And I certainly believe we need to acknowledge the importance of other ways of knowing and other types of experience that contribute to policy. Summarised perhaps in the question, should evidence trump all other inputs into policy? And I've certainly written on this topic along with my colleague, Kari Lancaster, who's here. Which leads me to research elitism and democracy. Expert knowledge has been seen as the basis for policy decisions. And yes, government should do what works. It provides a rational basis to design policy. However, Governments need to act in ways which accord with what the people want. That is actually what democracy is all about. And policy works when people have trust in the government and in their policy actions. Uh, Sheila Jasanoff said, the public is the theatre for establishing the credibility of state actions. And all of this is in line with democracy, doing what the people want. But hang on, do we really want to do what the people want? <laughs> Populism, post-truth, alternative facts, fake news, attacks on science, loss of faith in experts. We don't need experts. We don't trust experts anymore. Look where experts have led us to. That is exactly why we need to tackle this problem and we need to tackle it through our knowledge translation and our impact work. I think we need to do some rethinking of the relationship between the public and scientists I think, along with a number of other people, that our reliance on expert knowledge needs to be rethought. This is Sarowitz in the um, New Atlantis. Science will have to abdicate its protected political status and embrace both its limits and its accountability to the rest of society. And there's a whole argument that I probably don't have time to go into, but if we exclude non-experts from policy deliberation, we actually threaten the foundation of democracy itself. And it's a self-perpetuating vicious cycle where the experts say the public are ignorant, the public say the experts are arrogant, blah, blahs. And um, this then continues to perpetuate. And somehow, if we're the, we are the experts, somehow we need to deal with this environment that we find ourselves in, where we want to translate our evidence into effective policy. But we need to take seriously, I think, this problem of the role of citizens and um, the um, issue of democracy. I've expressed it in this way, how to humbly respect the role of the academic expert and how to not be arrogant and be the sole source of evidence for policy. And the research question that we are working on is how to connect knowledge translation to meaningful, inclusive, democratic policy development processes. And that works with Carrie Lancaster and Rosalind Deprose. Have I strayed too far? Probably, I'm sorry about that. But actually, I think all of this is connected. And I think if we're going to take translation of research into policy seriously, we need to think about these bigger ideas. I've given you five classes of research translation, how you do your work, how you disseminate it, the knowledge brokerage, the dialogue methods, and the expert influence. I can't tell you about what works because I don't know. PhD topics, PhD topics, PhD <laughs> topics. Case studies are cause for optimism. It can work. We do know that there are, we can get lucky and we can make change happen. And we should remain optimistic about our important role in society and in achieving positive policy <coughs> outcomes. I've talked about how context is essential. Policy is democratic. Acknowledging the privilege of research evidence and how to engage in policy change. The slide at the very beginning said issues and challenges for researchers. So here they are. How can we better translate our research findings into policy? 
how do knowledge translation skills align with our research skills? Are we actually any good at it? Do we need to be good at it? Can someone else do it for us? How is knowledge translation work funded and rewarded in a system that generally hasn't? It is progressively moving towards it. How can we achieve knowledge translation given these complex policy systems that I've talked about? Are you a knowledge broker or are you a policy entrepreneur? Is advocacy knowledge translation? How do we manage expectations? Not everyone's doing instrumental research. Are we all expected to be knowledge brokers and advocates? Oh, crazy. How do we manage that process institutionally and in the outside world? How can we rethink the relationship between scientific evidence and other types of policy relevant knowledge as we are working as knowledge translators? And what should we do about democracy in policy development? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. That was a thought-provoking and insightful presentation. Excellent. Um, we've got a few minutes left for questions. Um, so we'll open the floor up. I'll repeat the question. Okay. Um, thank you. So you ended with your punchline about democracy and <laughs> policy processes. But I, I wondered why you didn't just extend that to democracy and research processes, since oh. that's how you start. Thank you very much. That's Karen Fisher on extending democracy and policy to democracy and research. Yes, indeed, you're absolutely right. And that's a really nice full circle to come back to, because the point about multiple stakeholders and the democratisation of research is, is exactly how we end up with better translation, I think, more relevant, more applied um, research findings on policy of concern to people. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Very nice, circling right back. Thank you. Uh, can you please tell us your name and where you come from? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from SBRC. I just, um, uh, as you were talking, and um, also uh, as we are asked to pay more and more attention to uh, making policy impact with research, one thing I always kind of worried about is that um, how are we going to be held accountable for the negative impact <laughs> for the academic research? Because even the negative uh, impact, often the policies were actually advised by them as well. Sure, sure. So if we That's are a, kind of a push to into this field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the question is, um, should we certainly want to be held account for our positive policy influence? Should we be held account for the negative outcomes that are associated with bad policy? Oh, I have to say yes, don't I? Um, so I think there's a difference between um, policy as a decision of government versus how it's implemented. Um, and all sorts of things can go wrong in policy implementation that are beyond the initial policy idea uh, or, and or policy recommendation that hopefully has come from researchers. Maybe that's one way of distinguishing. But I think, I think we do need to be accountable. I think we need to be accountable for our policy recommendations um, as much as, um, you know, for, for those that get taken up as well as those that, that aren't. And then in terms of implementation, hopefully we're employed as the evaluators to do more commissioned research. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. The question is an example of a policy entrepreneur. So in some work we did around um, the police deployment of sniffer dogs, we identified members of the um, police department and um, ministers and ministerial advisers who were basically policy entrepreneurs on that particular topic who were running around, I mean, maybe not literally anyway, figuratively, running around talking to people, trying to match up the problem, the solution and the politics of the day. So I don't think they're a particular type of person. I think they're someone within the system who knows the system. I'm trying to think of whether I can think of an academic. 
I can probably think of a couple of people who work in NGO advocacy roles, who are policy entrepreneurs, who are up on the hill, so to speak, um, doing that kind of work on particular topics. Simon Chapman might be regarded as a policy entrepreneur. I haven't asked him that question. I don't know what he would think about that. But probably he's someone who's worked at the interface in that particular way, beyond, I think, knowledge brokerage. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there a correlation between when you present a piece, you talk about research in a global sense, mm. which is a scale of large studies, or just single PhDs, what actually matters to what Oh, that's such a good... So the question is, you know, is there a difference between, you know, big, significant, you know, long studies versus short little ones? In my own experience, I've had you know, large NH and MRC project grants that have not actually delivered policy impact. And I've written a tiny little piece um, that was written on the side. Um, as it turns out, that was to do with same-sex marriage and alcohol and other drugs. Um, and it got disseminated to all the federal politicians. And I got a lot of calls and a lot of people asking me about the evidence base. And it was, it was, it was just this crazy little thing that so there is evidence that um, same-sex attracted people have a higher rate of alcohol and drug problems, and part of that is to do with discrimination and stigma. So I just thought I'll just pop this into a, into a couple of pages. And that didn't cost the NH and MRC $600,000 and five <laughs> years' worth of work. So I don't think you know. I, I really don't think you know which bit of which study or which piece of work you're going to do is actually going to sing at the right point in time.